Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. Welcome, Rabbi Dr. Pearl. A pleasure to see you once again with the nice, uh, nice star fruit. And uh, we're looking at the unraveling the mysteries of Shekhin. And we want to thank you for this, the, th the, the three part series. Uh, very enjoyable. And I want to thank the Goldberg family again, is sponsoring the wedding of their daughter. Took place this, this, this past Sunday. Wish them a muzzle tov. And uh, we should have a year of smachot, a year of smachot, and uh, good things for all. Okay, thank you. Bakasha Rabbi Pearl. Hey. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, it is great to be back here once again. For those of you who have been with us for uh, all three parts of this series, thanks for sticking with us. I hope uh, I hope it's been enjoyable so far, and I hope we'll continue to enjoy today. And yes, our thoughts and feelings do go out to those who are uh, you know who, who experience damage or perhaps even uh, um, a loss to their physical safety, or, or perhaps even those who've lost loved ones due to um, the storms last night. Um, uh, and our, our, our tefillos and our thoughts are with them. <clears throat> so Monday night, Monday night we will begin Rosh Hashanah, and when we come home from shul, we will take our place at a beautifully set Rosh Hashanah table, we will pick up our Kiddush cup, we will recite the Kiddush on the first holiday of the new year, and then we will recite it is a bracha that we are all incredibly familiar with. It is a bracha that we have all recited countless times over the course of our life. And it is a bracha that I would think for most of us seems to make perfect sense. It's, it's not one of those things we've probably walked around struggling with thinking about what is this? Why do we say it? What does it mean? It seems to work where we've got a new time, a new moment in our lives, right? Um, we've been thinking about Rosh Hashanah for some weeks now. It's finally here. We make a bracha. Thank you, Hashem, for bringing me here. It seems to work quite well. <clears throat> and yet, Shehechianu is also one of those areas of halacha where when we begin to peel away the surface, when we begin to dig a little bit deeper into what it is, and particularly when we say it, what we thought we knew becomes a bit murkier, and the clarity that we perhaps we had begins to disappear. So let me start right back at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, because in fact, over the course of the first 25 hours of Rosh Hashanah, we're not gonna make one Shech Yana, we're actually going to make three. Three different times we're going to say Shech Yana, and there are three different types of Shech Yana. What are they? We named one. We say one at Kiddush. What are the other two? Shofar. Okay, excellent. When we blow the shofar on a Tuesday morning, on Tuesday morning, and we call candle Okay, candle lighting is the same as Kiddush. So women say it by candle lighting and men say it by, by Kiddush. But the third one is going to be when? Second night. Okay, good. The second night. And the second night, although we make it immediately after Kiddush, we're not actually making it on Kiddush or, or the Yom Tov. The, the new fruit. fruit. The new fruit. Okay, so there already we have three different instances in which we say Shehechianu. We say Shehechianu on the Yom Tov. We say Shehechianu on the mitzvah of blowing shofar. And we say Shehechianu on a new fruit. There are other times in which we are required or it is suggested that we say Shehechianu. Does anybody know what those are? We have mitzvot, we have yom tov, we have a new fruit. New clothes. New clothes, excellent, or new acquisition of some sort. Anything else? Barabat mitzvah. Actually, no, we don't say that a barabat mitzvah. It's a good thought, though. When we haven't been to Yerushalayim or the Kotel in a month or whatever it is. Close. I don't know about the Kotel Yerushalayim, but along those lines, if I haven't seen a friend in 30 days, I make a Shehechianu. So let's jump into the sources. <clears throat> Rabbi, how about when you inherit? When Chas oh. V'Shalom, uh, a relative passes away and you are the heir to the estate? 
Beautiful question. We're going to get there. Hold on. Right? So here we go. Gemara in Sukkah says, Ha'osalu lovely atzma omer baruch atashem alakim alecholam shechiyana v'kimena v'kiyana v'zman hazeh. Somebody who prepares a lulav for themselves as the mitzvah of lulav says a shechiyana. Right? And he says, this is the bracha on, on lulav. Good. Right. You make a sukkah, so the halach is we don't we don't say the shechina when we make the sukkah, we say it when we sit in the sukkah, but this is the source for making brachos on the performance of mitzvot. When we take our lulav, we make a she- we make the bracha on lulav, and we say a shehechianu. When we sit in the sukkah, we make leishev basukkah, and we say shehechianu. Good. That's one instance of saying shehechianu. <clears throat> the Gemara in Erevin asks the following question: The Amar Rabba ki havena be Rav Huna ibaylan mahulo mar zman berosh hashano v'yom kipurim. Do we say zman zman? Note the name of this bracha. It is throughout. Um, halachic literature throughout the Gemara, this bracha is referred to as zman, time. It's a reference to the bracha of Shehechianu that ends right with the words, right, lazman hazeh. So the question was asked, do we say a, a, a Shehechianu on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? And here are the two, uh, the two options. Kevan de mizman lizman asay amrina. Odilma kevan de lo ikru regalim lo amrina. So Perhaps um, because this is a, a holiday which comes at certain times, or at a certain time, once a, a, a year, we should say it on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Or perhaps it's not like the other regalim, it, and we only say Shehechianu on the regalim. So we, hear, we have from this source already that with, there's a separate inyan, there's a separate idea of saying a bracha on a regal on one of our Yom Tovim. The question is, is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur included? And so the Gemara continues, Ki asai bei Rav Yehuda amar ana akara chadeta nami amenazman. And so when he came to the house of Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda said, I, bracha, right? every time I eat a new pumpkin, every time I have a pumpkin for the first time in the year, I make a shehechianu. So, of course, I would make it on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Amri lei, rishus la kamibayili, ki kamibayili chova mai. And so I said to him, no, I understand you can make a shehechianu on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'm wondering whether one has to. Amar li Rav Shmuel de Amri Tavayu eno merzman, ela b'shalash regalim. And so in the name of Rav and Shmuel, they said, no. Only on the regalim, not on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Gemara, though, ultimately concludes, V'hilchasa omer zman, bro Hashanah v'yom kippurim, V'hilchasa zman omroa filu bashuk. The Gemara concludes um, uh, that, in fact, we do say, Shehechiyano on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, right? And we can say it even in the shuk at any point, right, over the course of Yantif. So here we have actually the source of two different types of, of Shehechianu. We have the Shehechianu of the Regel, of Yom Tif, which we now know includes Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And we have the Shehechianu on a new fruit, on a new, here it is, it, it's a gourd, right? It's a, it, um, a, a pumpkin of sorts, right? But we have a source for both. So, so far we've seen three different instances for Shehechianu. We've seen Shehechianu on a mitzvah, like Lulav and Sukkah. We see a separate conversation about Shehechianu around a yantif. And we see, for the first time, this idea of a bracha on a new fruit. Now, when that is brought down la halacha in Shulchan Aruch, it reads as follows. Haro'e pri chadash mischadesh mishana lishana mevarech Shehechianu. Someone who sees a new fruit that renews itself from year to year should recite a shehechianu. Is that what we normally do? No. No? Why not? What do we do? When we eat it. Okay, excellent. Right, we generally make that bracha, and that and, and the shulchan aruch continues. The prevalent minhag says the shulchan aruch is that we wait until we eat it to say to say the Shehechianu, but it's it's important and it will become important for the course of this year to note that the original um, uh, statement of this halacha is not that one makes a, 
that one makes a um <clears throat> Okay, good question about the, I see it now about the, about uh, on vegetables. It's true. That is not the, uh, the prevalent minhag right today. We do not say it on, on Adama, only on our fruit. Um, uh, but, but note again that the, that the, the source for this is something which is mischadesh mishana lishana, right? Something which, um, which comes from year to year. And the, the original articulation is that I make the bracha when I see it, not necessarily when I eat it. Okay, I see Jennifer has a hand up. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I just had a question. Let's say you enjoy saying Shehekiyanu, right? Uh, but can you go choose a fruit in order to say Shehekiyanu, or you come upon the fruit and say, I feel like this, or it's been given to you? Can, can you go, can you... So it would, that, it would, it would seem, yeah. it would seem that it, you can act, you can certainly seek out a, a fruit which you have not had in the course of a year, right, in order to make a shechianu on it, we actually have sources that there were um, uh, there were rabbanim who did this. They would save money in order to go and buy right, various things which they did had not had in order to make a shechianu. The question of whether oh, okay. I can make a shechianu just because I feel like making a shechianu, right? Um, that's a little more complicated. Yeah. And we'll see. We'll see some of that a little bit later on. Okay, okay thanks so much. My pleasure. And the Gemara in Brachos, the second, the second source that you have in front of you, um, says as follows, Al Gishamim v'al Besoros Tovos, Omer Baruch HaTov v'hametiv. So Rabbi Kalman was referring to earlier that Geshem, generally speaking, we, we hope is Levracha, and here we're talking about Geshem that is Levracha, no Leklala, good rates, not the kind that some of you have experienced. Right? On those, and, and on good news, we make a Bracha of HaTov v'hametiv, Al Besoros Raos, Omer Baruch Dayon Emes, Right on on bad news, we make the bracha that I, we acknowledging that Hashem is the um, is the true judge, right? and then continues bana bayis chadash the kana kelim chadashim omer baruch atashem lo kelim lecholam shtech yano v'kim yano v'giyano lezman hazeh somebody who buys who purchases a new house or purchases new vessels, makes this bracha of shehechianu, v'kimanu v'giyanu lezman hazeh. So that is now source number, that is instance number four. We have regalim, we have mitzvos, we have a pre, a new fruit, and now we learn that when you buy something new, a house or new vessels, one makes a shehechianu as well. Good, and now the Gemara on the bottom of the page, it says, A friend whom you have not seen for 30 days, and now you see them. Here too, you make the bracha of Shech Yanu, Vikimanu, Vigianu, Lesman Good. So, what do we have in front of us? We have actually six right, different instances. Right. Um, uh, good news again. Generally, we make hatovah amitiv. Sometimes we will make it shechianu. Um, uh, but six different instances in which we will say a bracha of shechianu right? on a mitzvos, on a yom tov, on a new fruit. Again, sometimes on a good news, on a new purchase, and on seeing a friend. So my question to you is: What do these have in common? What is the what rule? What's the underlying principle that obligates me to say the bracha of Shehechianu? What would you say? Gratitude. Gratitude. Anytime that I'm grateful, I make a Shehechianu? Somebody gives me a loan. I say Shehechianu? No, no, no. No. no but Maybe. Okay. The, oh. I see Alana Lubin suggests renewal. Okay. Um, maybe would, to make sure. Oh, yeah, go ahead. May, maybe to make sure that we acknowledge that this is coming from Hashem, not anything that we've made or given man-made. So let me ask you something on the bracha uh, on when we before I blow shofar, right? I make a bracha. But now, in addition to that, I also have to make a bracha. Right, I understand. I would okay. understand your approach when it comes to a new fruit, right? Even, but even there, I do. I make a bracha. I make a bracha on the fruit also, right? Acknowledging it came from Hashem. So why is shehechianu? 
something to do with Zman, the time? I don't know. Okay, there's certainly those who thought so. I see Zev put in the chat, Simcha. Okay, good, right? So let's, let's take Simcha, you let's take... The, yeah, go if ahead. You look, if you look at the words of the bracha itself, right, that, that somehow we have been sustained to reach this moment. Yeah, there's something there, right? There's something there that seems to be, right, trying to teach us something, and we're going to hopefully be able to tease that out Right, um, toward well, as we get to the end. But let's let's work with Zev's suggestion here that that the underlying principle here is simcha, right? which is certainly the the approach that many of our rishonim right, and achronim have taken. Of the six that are on here, which one is perhaps the most difficult to fit into that framework? What would you say if if happiness? Is the common thread? Mitzvah. Okay, great. Okay, mitzvah. All right. I, I would agree. Right. Um, uh, so Zev points out there's an idea of simcha shel mitzvah, but but sometimes it's some mitzvahs seem to lend themselves more than others to the idea of of happiness. And in fact, right when uh, when, when the Rambam tries to, and we know the Rambam was, was all about create, was creating clarity and organization, right, and putting various disparate pieces of halacha together to create right, a coherent whole. And when he describes which mitzvot we say a shehechianu on, you can almost hear him struggling <laughs> to create some sort of coherent principle behind this. Listen to his words. Kol mitzvah, shehi mizman lizman. Any mitzvah that comes from time to time. Kigon, shofar v'sukkah v'lulav, umikra megila v'neir chanaka. So any, any mitzvah that comes from time to time. V'chein kol mitzvah o mitzvah shehi kinyan lo. Kigon, tzitzis u'tfilin u'mzizah u'maka. And also any mitzvah which involves a, an acquisition of some sort like tzitzis or tefillin or mezuzah or creating a, um, a railing around your roof. V'chein mitzvah she'ena tadira, ve'ena mitsuya, becholes. And also a mitzvah which doesn't happen very often and isn't always there. Sharehi domel a mitzvah she'hi mizman mizman. Because it's sort of like a mitzvah that comes from time to time. Can go milas beno u'pidyur nabein. On those we say a shechiyanu. Now, by the way, you may be no, you may you may note that we don't ex- pass in exactly like the Rambam here. Um, we don't say a shechiyanu on on a mila, right, which was going to become important in a moment. Right? But but can you hear the Rambam almost struggling here to put these various mitzvos together? Like when which mitzvahs do we say it and which mitzvahs don't and so he has to come up with this principle that says anything that's from time to time or involves acquisition or it isn't exactly from time to time but it's not so routine that it's sort of like it's time to time those are the mitzvahs that we say it's a little difficult now tosfos on the other hand says it very clearly exactly as Zev suggested that First of all, he asks our question. Amazing how he asked our question, right? says, Says Tosfos very clearly. I, I can't, I can't quite understand it. There are some mitzvos where we do say shehechianu, and there are some mitzvos where we don't. For example, it says, according to Tosvos, that when you make your sukkah or you take your lulav, you are supposed to say shechiano. But when you make tzitzis or you make tefillin, again, different than the Rambam, he says, you don't say a shechiano. Why not? Tosvos wants to know. Ultimately, Tosos comes to the following conclusion and writes, Venira de mitzvah sheyesh aleha simcha tiknu shehechianu. He says, a mitzvah that has, that in it, 
that for which simcha is an integral part, for which happiness is a critical part of this mitzvah, there we say shehechiyanu, and those for which simcha is not an integral part, right? Um, it is not something that we say shehechiyanu on. And to prove the point, Tosos in a different place, Tosos in Eruvin, right, notes that um, whereas we make a shehechianu on pidyon haben, on the redeeming of the firstborn, we do not make a bracha of shehechianu on mila. Why not? If the whole idea behind shehechianu is simcha, so why wouldn't you make it at a bris mila? Because it's, inter- it's intrinsically uh, simcha. Oh, you say it better. I mean, that, that's nice. But Same reason we don't it's say hello on the last days of Pesach. Somebody suffered for us to be happy. Because it's painful. Yeah, sad. Right, sad. Right. We've, all, we've all been to the bris and heard the baby crying. Right? It's it's painful. Hard. Yeah, and you know, and, and you, so you can argue the baby doesn't feel, doesn't feel, and it's not, whatever it may be. It's hard to say to make a bracha on happiness, right? When you hear it's that child obligation in the Brit. Sorry? It's part of our obligation in the Brit. I mean, I meant to say the Brit Baina Batarim. I mean covenant with Hashem. Okay, but but so, again, but, but that so doesn't have something we have to feel happy, right, at that moment, right? Yeah. And hence according again to Ashkenazim, we do not say we do not say a Shahyano at um at a bris mila. <laughs> um, okay, so that would suggest that even in our, even the performance of mitzvahs, at least according to Tosvos, we can stick with what we're going to call the happiness hypothesis, right? And that, in fact, what all of these have in common, it is this idea that, in fact, engenders a sense of happiness, it involves a sense of happiness. Good, that's the end of our shear. Right, we ha- now understand the mystery of Shehechiyan. Or do we? <clears throat> First of all, it's important to note that there are halachic implications if this is in fact the case. Right? If what is at the core and the root of Shehechiyanu is Simcha, right, there are ramifications with regard to our halachic practice. So let's look at two of them. The first one would be a case of doubt. Meaning, let's say I've got a case where I'm not sure if I should say Shehechianu or not. Let's say I can't quite remember if I had this fruit over the course of the last year. I know it's been a while, but has it been a year? Maybe it's been 11 months, right? Maybe it's been 10, I'm not sure. What if I'm not 100% sure if this is the kind of purchase that requires a Shehechianu or doesn't? What if I can't remember if I've seen my friend? Was it 29 days or was it 30 days? I'm not sure if I should make the bracha or not. So normally, when it comes to a bracha, when we're not sure if we should make it or not, anybody know what the rule is? Don't make it. Always we don't make it. Why don't we make it? Because to say the bracha, that's a mitzvah de rabbana. Right? That's a rabbinic, a, a rabbinic enactment that we should make a bracha on this particular act. But to take Hashem's name in vain, that is a biblical prohibition, right? So if we have to weigh potentially taking God's name in vain versus saying the rabbinic enactment of a blessing, we always opt, don't say it, right? Lest you come to take God's name in vain. However, when it comes to Shehechianu, the Bach Interestingly, Rabbi Yol Circus in the 16th century interestingly argues that actually, no, when it comes to Shehechianu, Shehechianu is different. If you're not sure whether to say a Shehechianu, but you feel happy about this occasion, then go ahead, gesund to hate, say a Shehechianu. Thank God, thank God for having brought you to this moment. Let's look at it inside. Right? 
ומבורך לו יסעלה על שהחיינו, על שהחיהו, וקיימו, right? עד הזמן הזה. Says the Bach, this is fundamentally different than all other mitzvahs. If you're actually feeling happy, since the core of Shehachianu is happiness, and I'm feeling happy about eating this new fruit, whether I it was 11 months or it was 12 months, if I'm feeling happy about seeing this, this particular friend, whether it was 30 days or it was 29 days, but I'm feeling good about it, then what's wrong? with saying, blessed are you, Hashem, who kept me alive and sustained me and brought me to this moment. That's certainly not a transgression <coughs> of taking Hashem's name in vain, says the Bach, because at its core is this idea of happiness. A second implication, this is the Shulchan Aruch with regard to the laws of the three weeks. Says the Shulchan Aruch, Tov li zaher mi lomar shehechiyanu bein hamitzari al pri o al malbush. Aval pidyon abein omer velo yachmitz hamitzvah. Says the Shulchan Aruch, we should be careful when it comes to the three weeks not to say a shehechiyanu on a pri, on a fruit, or on, on new clothing. Why? What do we know about the three weeks? Tzar. Say it again. Tzar. Okay, it's a time of tzar. It's a time of avelut, right? It's a time of mourning. Misha nichnas av mimatim be simcha. Simcha. When when av comes in, right? We have we have less. We have we're supposed to take ourselves back in terms of the amount of. Um, <clears throat> the amount of happiness that we have. This is a sad time between Shiva Sarbatamuz and Tishabav. And so if in fact Shehechianu is all about happiness, it's all about things that make us happy. So it would make sense, right? That during these during these three weeks, we should avoid such things. Now, before we go on, the, does anybody notice there's there's something peculiar about the way the Shulchan Aruch stated this particular halacha? So, Right. Does it strike anyone as, would there have been a clearer way to say this? Okay, there's someone who is not muted. No? Anything, anything jump out at you? He doesn't expressly forbid it. He just says it's good to be careful not to recite it. Okay, he, yes, he doesn't expressly forbid it. He says it's good to avoid, but but good to avoid what? Well, expressing happiness when we should be mourning. But shouldn't we, wouldn't we have expected the Shulchan Aruch say, Tov li zaher mi lechol pri chadash o mi lil bosh beged chadash which would then of course generate the need for a shehechianu, right? In other words, it seems to be if the act is what generates simcha, right, then, then don't do these acts during this time period. Be and these are acts which happen to involve a shehechianu, but, but refrain from those acts, right? The fact that the Shulchan Aruch writes, refrain from saying a shehechianu, is something the, to think about. Simcha, okay, we're going to come. Is, the simcha is that they're a mitzvah, not, it's not, it's not yeah. Yeah. These aren't, these aren't mitzvahs. Eating a new fruit's not a mitzvah. No, but the, the, the mitzvah, your, it is a mitzvah to say the shehechianu, so yeah. you're happy that you have, have the opportunity of performing the mitzvah of saying shehechianu. Mm, hard, because we perform other mitzvahs between, right, be, during the three weeks. And I am going to say a bracha on the fruit. I'm just not going to say a shehechianu. Okay, good. We're going to come back to it. But for right now, these are two different implications. If, in fact, right, the, the, the core of this idea is happiness, we understand Right, um, uh, the previous in, in the previous case, right, um, uh, we understand why. If you're in a case of doubt, perhaps you would say it anyway. Unlike other mitzvos, right, we understand why in the three weeks you should refrain from saying a shachianu because at the core of this idea is the notion right, um, of 
of shechi of of um of happiness. Zev, I see your question. According to the Bach, can we say shechiano on a fruit? We enjoy every time we say it. It's not a crazy conclusion. It, it is not a crazy conclusion from the from the ling, from the language of the Bach. Um, and by the way, many 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 hold that with regard to a fruit, you're you're, you're in the category of rishus to begin with. Right, so there, there does seem to be a little bit more flexibility than perhaps in um, in some other areas like like Shechianu on on Yantif. Okay, but as I said before, this is this is not as simple as it seems. Right, this this happiness hypothesis, as we'll call it, um, struggles to stand up to a whole variety of other halachic sources as well as circumstances that we, that we might be able to create. And so let's take a look at a variety of ways in which I think the, the happiness hypothesis comes under question. <clears throat> the Gemara Embrachos, which we saw before, which started by saying that one who buys a, uh, a new house or acquires new um, new clothing, new, new, sorry, new vessels. It right, should remain, should say a shehechiana. Now the Gemara has a long and um, complicated conversation there about exactly what kinds of new vessels require a shehechiana. But I, I'm going to share with you just one pot- one potential. Right, possibility of, of how we read this Gemara that's brought down there, because we have to understand where everybody is coming from. The Gemara says, We're trying to establish where is their machlokas, where is their dispute around whether we should say a shehechianu or not. So here's one way of reading it, is that according to Rav Huna, right, the, um, uh, the machlokas right, is around a case um, of kana v'chazar v'kana, a case where I already acquired this object, and now I'm acquiring it again. So here we're talking about not a case where I inherited perhaps an object, and now I'm buying it for the first time. But an object that I actually went out and bought once, and now I'm buying it again. Do I have to say a shehechianu? Rav Huna says no. He says no. It, it'd be one thing if you've never had it before. For sure you have to make a shehechianu. And it's even another thing if you inherited it, but now you're actually acquiring it for the first time. You have to make a shechianu. But something that you've already purchased, you don't have to make a shechianu on that. The Rabbi Yochanan Amar, Afilu Kana Chazar Vekana Tzarich Levarich. Rabbi Yochanan, according to this, this opinion, says, no, even if I've not just had it, but I, I've bought it before, I still need to make a, um, a shechianu. So let's take a case right, of the Rolex. I don't own a Rolex, right? but I imagine that for those right, who purchase a Rolex, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty um, monumental moment right, in your life. And I would imagine even that somebody who inherited a Rolex, they had one, but got to a point in their careers, you know, they're sufficiently earning enough money that they're able to acquire one for themselves. Good shine. It's also, it creates a certain sense of happiness Right, the, the achievement that they haven't had before. Okay, good. Right. But let's say I already was able to purchase one. And now I purchase a second and a third and a fourth. I have to imagine that at a certain point, right, this is like, it becomes like nothing to me. Right, what's the big deal? It's a, it's another watch. I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't wear a watch that isn't a Rolex at a, at a certain point. So no, what's another one? So if the issue is happiness, understanding Rabbi Yochanan according to this reading is hard, right? That even if I not just had something, but I've already purchased something, the same thing, and I'm purchasing it again, I still have to make a shayachiyanu, it's perhaps a little bit difficult. All right, next question. When it comes to mitzvahs, so we said before that the Tosos had said, that uh, that mitzvos that have that involve simcha, right, are the mitzvos that we say shehechianu on. 
This is the Shulchan Aruch in Yoridea. Chayim levarich kodem sheyechasa asher kiddushanu misosav tzivanu al kisui dam be'afar. We're talking about shechting for karbanos, and we know that there is a halacha that we have to cover the blood. Says the Ramah, Misha shachar pam harishon mevarich shehechianu al hakisoi. Avalo al hashchita de mazik libiria. Says the Ramah, the first time a Kohen does this kind of shechita and he covers the blood, he has to say a shehechianu. Really? I mean, that's a, that's a simchadek mitzvah? covering the blood of an animal that you just slaughtered. And the Ramah himself says, on the Shechita itself, you don't say it because you're hurting this animal. Covering blood involves Simcha? I don't know. Let's go to Yantif. So Yantif, we all understood. It seemed to make so much sense, right? Yantif has a specific a halacha of being of, of, of Simcha and whether that is true for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur also. That's a whole other shear. But there's an Indian of Simcha on, on Yantif. But let's be real, realistic for a moment. Monday night, you've just been preparing for Rosh Hashanah, you know, since, you know, since Shabbos, since Motei Shabbos, all day Sunday, all day Monday. Right? Or you've been at work all day Monday. Well, those of you who are in the States, it's Labor Day, so maybe you're not. So maybe this year it's a little easier. But you finally come to the Rosh Hashanah table and you're about to, and, and you're about to make Kiddush. Are, are, are you already happy? Is the happiness there? In other words, I understand that over the course of Yantif, I'm supposed to do things, sit with my family, right? go to shul, learn Torah, do things that will cause happiness. I get that. But to make a bracha on happiness now, right? Right as right is Yantif starts, I haven't, ha- haven't even had any Yantif yet. Right? It's, it's just coming in. Am I already sufficiently happy to make a bracha on happiness? Somebody asked me about inheritance. So this, if the others didn't convince you that sim, the Simcha hypothesis was in trouble, uh, this one certainly should. Says the Shulchan Aruch, Meis Aviv Mevarich Dayan Ha'emes. Father passed away, you learn that your father passed away, you make the bracha of Dayan Ha'emes. Hayalo mamon sheyor show, im lo achim mevarich gam kein shehechianu. What? You learn that your father passed away, but it happens to be that he had some money and you inherit it, and, and, and you have to say a shechiano. I mean, can we, can we possibly imagine that this is supposed to be a moment of simcha? We're supposed to be rejoicing? I mean, halacha is so incredibly sensitive when it comes to issues of death and avelus and grieving. How could you possibly, how could a halacha possibly suggest we're supposed to be happy perhaps at the this, moment? Go ahead. Perhaps this is really more a literal rendering of the bracha that we thank God that we are alive to mourn our parents as opposed to chas v'shalom, a parent being alive to mourn a child. To recognize that is also something we take for granted but wasn't taken for granted then. Okay, I, I, I like that and I like it particularly because as we're going to mention in a, in a moment, it, the bracha doesn't actually say anything about simcha, right? It's not there. Right? And that's, I think, is important. <clears throat> we're going to get there in just a moment. Let me give you the following scenario. There's a man, we'll call him Joe. Joe is a middle-aged man, goes to his doctor for his annual physical. Doctor takes... Some blood gets back to him a little bit later. Says, Joe, we got to change some things. Your cholesterol is too high. You're getting to the point where it's dangerous. You need to start changing the way you eat. Doc says to Joe, listen, I know you love a good steak, but you just can't do it anymore. You just can't do it. And so... Joe comes home, talks to his wife and says, listen, this is what the doctor said. I've got to make some changes. No red meat for me from here on. I'm just, I'm going to cut it out of my diet 
completely. I love red meat, but I'm not going to do it. And it was hard for the first couple of weeks and then the first couple of months, but he stuck with it. You know, the temptation came and he, his resolve held steady and he made his way through the year without ever touching a piece of steak. Comes a year later and his wife says to him, listen, you know, you've, you've done so beautifully on this diet. And look, you're, you're slim, you're, your numbers are down. It's okay, let's go out once and let's, let's celebrate. It, and and you'll have a you'll have the dinner you you, you love. Let let's you know indulge for one night, and then you'll go back on your on your diet. And so Joe thinks this is a fantastic idea. They and they they make a reservation at the local steakhouse. They go to the they go to the restaurant. They sit down. He orders the juiciest steak on the menu. The um, waiter brings it to him, and Joe is in heaven. I mean simcha. This is a simcha. So he's about to take a bite of this juicy steak. Does he make a shehechianu? Putting the bach aside for a moment. Does he make a shehechianu? Do we make shehechianu on steak? He might. We don't. We don't. We don't make a bracha on meat. We don't make a shehechianu on meat. We don't. Even though he's incredibly happy and he hasn't had it in a year. We don't make a bracha. We don't make a shehechianu on a steak. I, so he finishes his steak and it was absolutely delicious. He loved every piece of it. He cleans the plate. And of course, right, he's not going to let, let a good opportunity go by. He's going to have dessert too. He's already having a steak. He may as well have a dessert, right? And so he looks at the, 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 the dessert menu and he sees this incredibly described pot of ice cream banana split. What better way to finish, finish the evening than to have this pot of ice cream banana split and so he orders it and it comes and it's beautiful and gorgeous and he digs in. Does he make does he make a shahiano on the on the pot of ice cream? Uh, I think I would go for yes. Well, not on the ice cream. But before he takes that bite of the ice oh, cream, he yeah. notices the banana the star fruit. The star fruit. The star fruit. Right there it is on the side of his, the side of his, uh, of his ice cream. Now he says, Amazing. <laughs> the simcha, right? Forget about the steak. Forget about the ice cream, but the star fruit. Ooh, <laughs> that's the real simcha. But wait, can you make a shehachianu uh, if he's technically now just mixed milk with meat? No, 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 no. It's a pile of ice cream. Pile of ice cream. <laughs> Sorry, I, hope I made that really clear. Right? Pile of ice cream. Oh, oh, um, pile. Oh, 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 oh. Ice Sorry, cream. I thought you said. I didn't think you said that word. Yeah, I thought you said a pint of ice cream. Sorry. So. Oh, no. Okay. So again, if the mechayev, if the what what triggers the shehechiano is happiness, then something's off in this equation. It's off because Joe was really happy when he got that steak. And he was pretty happy when he got the ice cream. The star fruit, that, he could have done without. But there, all of a sudden, he's high of Tamika Shehechian. And now the case that the question that we raised earlier. If in fact this is a bracha on Simcha, why not say so? Why not say something about Simcha in this bracha? And after all, we have brachos where we make it very clear that this is about Simcha. Right? This comes from the Shavu Bracho. Sameach tesameach. Reim haovim kisamecha cha yitzircha beganeinu mikedev. Baruch ata Hashem nesameach hasamekala. Blessed are you, Hashem, who makes the bridegroom and, and bride happy. Let's make a similar bracha. If this is all about happiness, let's make a bracha. Thank you, Hashem, for making me happy. And what's also strange is that at one of our happiest moments, we don't say a shechion. Now, Svaradim generally, uh, some Svaradim do, but many have the custom that they wear something new under the chuppah and that, so that their shechion is actually on the new clothing, not, on the, not on, the, on the wedding itself. Now, I don't want to get too far into it, but there are some pretty interesting things that we can find in our Rishonim and Achorim about why we don't say a shechion. You know, perhaps 
perhaps we're not even sure, we're not sure how this is going to work out. People are a little nervous, right? So it's not time to say Shekha Yana yet. Okay. Right? But we do make a bracha on simcha at that moment, but the one time where we're making a bracha on simcha, we, we don't make a bracha on, we don't, we don't say shechianu. All right. So those are our, our questions. Right? Are we really happy enough to make a bracha? Right? When we purchase something we already have, the Rolex case. Are we actually experiencing happy, happiness at the moment of, of um? Kiddush, as, as Yantif begins, is covering as kisui hadam really something that involves simcha? Are, are we happy enough to warn a bracha when, 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 our, when we, at the moment that we've learned that our parents have died, we're supposed to make a shehech you know, that's, that's a moment of simcha? How could it possibly be? Right? Are, are we actually happier about the star fruit when we, when we were about the steak, if in fact this is all about happiness? And if it's about happiness, why isn't it in the bracha? And in fact, the bracha, as we noted earlier, when referred to in, in halachic literature, in, and, and in the Gemara in particular, is always referred to as zman. Meaning there's, there seems to be something about time that is the, a, a determinant factor in Shehechianu. And we know that for some cases, right, it's something which comes from time to time, but but not always. And so what, what, is the, what is the role of time and why doesn't it specifically say something about happiness? Right? And why is it that the one time that we actually do make a brach on happiness, we don't say a <clears throat> All right. So let me offer perhaps a slightly different approach. Um, I think it answers some of our questions. Shechianu and the sugya of Shechianu is, is more complex than, than everything I've brought here. Do I think it answers everything? Probably not. But uh, even if it doesn't, I think it's worth thinking about and will hope, hopefully enhance our experience of the upcoming Yom Tovim nonetheless. The approach I want to suggest requires our taking a moment outside of our Masora from, and then coming back in. <clears throat> so as I'm sure many of you know, over the last 20 years or so, there has been a whole um, area of research that has emerged around, um, first around areas of mindfulness, right? and then an entire area known as positive psychology. Um, <clears throat> mindfulness, that is the idea of being present, has been studied quite extensively. And here you see one particular study on the benefits of being present. And in the introduction to this, um, to this piece, we, um, uh, these researchers write that mindfulness captures a quality of consciousness that is characterized by clarity and vividness of current experience. Mindfulness means a vividness of current experience, of being here. And they write that it's long been associated with well-being enhancement, and it may also contribute to well-being and happiness in a direct way. This is what they set out to study. The conclusion writes that it, our hope is that the present research nourishes this trend because it indicates that mindfulness is a reliably and validly measured characteristic that has a significant role to play in a variety of aspects of mental health. They set out to study whether the act of being present impacts one's mental state, one's emotional well being, and concluded that in fact it does. Tal Ben Shachar is probably the best known um, professor in the area of positive psychology today. He is an Israeli, um, taught for many years at Harvard. I believe he's back in Israel today. In this book, Happier, he sets out um, a different archetypes, different paradigms for those who pursue happiness, one of which ultimately land in failure. One of them being what he calls the rat racer. The rat racer is the person who is always running to, to something else, always thinking about the next thing, is delaying any sort of gratification because there's always something next. There's always something else I have to do, someplace else I have to be, something else I have to attain. And says Tal Ben Shachar, one actually cannot achieve happiness in that mindset. As Thoreau says, he writes, however, life is too short to be in a hurry. If we are always on the go, we are reacting to the exigencies of day-to-day -day life rather than allowing ourselves the space 
to create a happy life. To be happy requires carving out space. Now, it's not just that. He says it's a combination of pleasure and meaning. Pleasure, though, can only be experienced when one is present. One doesn't experience pleasure if you're always thinking about what's next and thinking about what's coming. Pleasure itself alone is hedonism, he says, but pleasure with meaning, with some sense of purpose. So being present, but also understanding that I'm part of something, I'm something bigger, is what creates happiness. Now, what is the bracha that we've been talking about? The bracha is not a bracha on happiness. It's a bracha on time. time. But not just time. What time? Present. The present moments time. That make up our lives. The happy moments that make up our lives. It's yes, the, but no. Right? The, the, bracha, time. the bracha very specifically is about zman ha zeh. It's about this time. This time about being in this moment. And in fact, there's almost a mantra, right? The language of the bracha is, is quite different than most others. Shehechianu, v'kiyamanu, v'higianu. It's almost as if we're trying to build a mental state of being bizman hazeh. And if that, in fact, is the case, let me make the following suggestion. Again, take it, leave it. We'll see how it works or doesn't with our, with our other sources. But here's the suggestion. Is it possible that sometimes we don't say shehechianu because we're happy, but we're happy because we say shehechianu? That is, by creating a state of mindfulness by being present, which is what Shehechian, the function of Shehechianu, is to take us off the, the, the hamster wheel, to take us out of the rat race, out of thinking what's next, what's coming, where am I going, and placing us in the here and now to perhaps appreciate things that I wouldn't have otherwise appreciated. By doing that, I become happy. I create the space for, that is necessary to actually experience simcha. So let's take that back to the questions that we had. Are we happy enough to warrant a bracha when we purchase something we already have? Perhaps we aren't left on our own. But if we take a moment to become present and say, you know what, this may be my fourth Rolex, but look at this. I'm capable, right? Look what a Kaddish Baruch Hu has given me. I'm able to do this, right? Then it will create a sense of simcha, a sense of appreciation for what I have. Are we happy the moment Yom Tov begins? Probably not. We're, we're, we're tired. We've been cooking all day. We've been at work all day. We just made it to Mincha on time. We're, you know, perhaps, but what's the function of Shehech Yanu? To create the simcha, to say, wait a minute. I'm going to put all that aside and come lazman hazeh, focus in on my family that's sitting around this table. Focus in on what I'm about to do. Be present. Don't go into that yont of meal thinking about work, thinking about the deadline that's coming up after yont of. Be here because that will help create the happiness. Is covering, is kisoi hadam a bracha that involves simcha? I don't know, but, but could it? Can we create this moment as a moment of appreciation for what HaKadosh Baruch has given us and the lifestyle that he's given us and the opportunity for Kabbalah We could. <clears throat> At the moment of our parents' death, are we supposed to be happy? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that's what Chazal meant, right? When they said, make a bracha, right, if there's a Yerusha. What do they mean? They mean that in this moment of grief, right, if there is something that you can appreciate, if there is something there, right, that, that, that you should be grateful for, make a bracha that will help you identify that moment, that piece of this experience, right, which is, which is worth noting, which is worth having gratitude, rather than being swept away by the grief. Take a moment and say, you know what, I'm not supposed to be happy here, but I'm supposed to be present and know that there are some things here, right, that may in fact 
right? Um, be good. What about the star fruit? Let me take you back to the beginning of this year. When we, are we supposed to make a bracha on a new fruit? What was the original articulation of that halacha? Do you first remember? Time of the, year. the first time you? In a, in a year. The first time you didn't that, eat it. That, you said eat it. No, what it's to see? see it. Oh, right? Okay, good. Right. The, the first, the initial articulation of this was when you see a fruit, right, that comes back year to year. It seems that what Chazal had in, in, in mind here wasn't necessarily the joy, the pleasure of eating. It was that there is a, there is a special moment when a fruit comes back into bloom, when it, the, that tree has been desolate for an entire year, right? No signs of life. And all of a sudden, without much doing, and this is different than other crops. Somebody brought up vegetables before. This is different. A tree is different, right, than, the, than crops that I've sowed and I've toiled and I've worked at. The tree pretty much produces that fruit on its own, right? And when that fruit comes back into bloom, the point is not that I'm overjoyed, but that a Baruch Hu wants us to stop and notice it. Notice that fruit on the tree. And say, because I might miss it otherwise. The steak I'm not going to miss. Right? That, that's not what the bracha is about. The bracha is about creating a mindfulness, about being present at a particular time that will create simcha right, as a result. Why do we make the bracha on time rather than happiness? Well, that, that's it. Because it is about time. It's about this time. It's about being in this time, which is ultimately a facilitator for the happiness that comes. And why don't we make a bracha right, on, during, um, uh, during a wedding? So I, perhaps, perhaps one could say you don't need it. Perhaps you don't need it. Now, either because you've already made a bracha on Simcha and the Sheva Brachos, perhaps, but perhaps this isn't uh, for all, right? All the moments in our lives, the one in which we're probably going to be the most present, the one in which we're there and experiencing joy may be, may be our wedding. And perhaps, therefore, we don't need to say this bracha. Now, is there any source for this? Is there any grounding in our texts for this? So I'll take you back to a question that I raised earlier and, and, and suggest maybe, maybe, right, this is, this is what's going on there. And that is the Shulchan Aruch about the threes. Remember, I noted this was, his language was a little bit strange. He says, you shouldn't say a shehechianu during the three weeks. He didn't say, don't buy a new fruit or don't wear new clothing. He said, don't make a shehechianu on those things. Now, the Mishnah Brewer immediately jumps in and says, well, of course, what he means is don't eat a fruit, a new fruit that would require you to say a shehechianu and don't buy new clothing <laughs> that would require you right, to make a shehechianu. But, but the Sharei Tshuva brings down something different. He notes... And I'm not exactly sure he's, I think he's citing of Shmuel Vital, that Shmuel Vital noted right, that at his father's house, uh, is the great Chaim Vital, he remembers that Chachamim would come together during the three weeks and he would encourage them to eat new fruits during the three weeks, but not say Asheachtiyan. Why? Perhaps this is the reason. If a shehechianu is not said over simcha, if the act itself isn't necessarily a happy one, but the bracha creates the simcha, then perhaps I can do those things. I'm not passing lahalacha here, right? But perhaps I can do those things during the three weeks because those things don't actually create simcha without the shehechianu. They only, the, she, the simcha comes about because I've made the shehechianu. Without the shehechianu, there is no simcha. And therefore, perhaps these things are allowed as long as I don't make a shehechianu along with them. Again, I don't know that that's exactly what's being said here. And I can't be 100% sure, right? that this is in fact what Chazal had in mind when it came to Shekhinu. But what I do know is as follows. I do know that this can be incredibly powerful right, and incredibly enriching for us and for our experience of these mitzvahs. If in fact we understand as we get into uh, Kiddush on Rosh Hashanah night, 
And as we hear the shofar for the first time right, during Rosh Hashanah day, and as we come to eat the new fruit on, on the second night, that each time we say Hashem Hechiyanu, what we are doing is we are allowing ourselves and we are um, to be present in the moment, to come to this moment, to take everything else that happened earlier in the day or that's coming up in the days to come, put that aside and allow us to zone in and be mindful about the experience that we're having. I do think that it will ultimately help Help us to create the simcha, to create the joy that is intended by this bracha of Sheikh Yanu Bikimanu Bikiyanu Lazman Hazar. May this be an upcoming Yantif season filled with joy for all of us, and may we all see the type of, uh, of joy and happiness that is intended by this bracha, right, so that we come again next year to these brachos and can say once again that we're back, Sheikh Yanu Bikimanu Bikiyanu Lazman Hazar. Thank you very much, Yashakoch. We, of course, do not say Shechiano on learning Torah. Uh, we don't even make a brach on learning Torah. I love that the Tosfot, you know, that explains uh, you learn at nine o'clock in the morning, then you don't learn again all day. You don't make another brach on the learning because it's one continuum. It, one is theoretical learning. You go to the workplace, you're practicing your learning. Anyways, but uh, thank you really for a very... Uh, inspiring sheer and uh, I, I love that halacha if I can say that about um, inheriting money I think I think the hal- if, if you were to tell somebody to make a bracha on the death of parents because you became a multimillionaire that'd be a terrible thing so the halacha knows that you're a little happy when a parent dies kids don't want to admit it but when they inherit a lot of money there it it it, ting- it uh, adds a little bit of comfort. It's not nice to say it. So our rabbis, I think, force us to make the bracha to recognize that reality. That's how I always understood the halacha. But anyways, that's um, okay. Enough of me. Anybody have any comments or any questions I'd like to ask uh, for a minute or two? I think you got through all the questions pretty much as you were going through the shir on the chat box. Otherwise, we'll thank you. Wish you a shana tova. Tiva tova. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to learning with you again in the future. And good luck. Hatzlacha in Florida in your new, uh, new two new positions in Florida. Rob Gill is uh, in the process of getting a school off the ground for, for gifted children. Um, so uh, it uh, would be, I imagine, the first one, the first Jewish school like that in North America. I'm not aware of any. So much uh, And uh, anyways, and enjoyed the weather. Uh, so I'd like to ask one although question. unfortunately Florida gets lots of hurricanes you know what they had in New York yesterday is a little unusual Florida I guess they're more I know they're more, more, more prepared but it's more common but anyway I'd like to ask a question if I may uh, yes quickly sure Vakasha. anniversaries that we celebrate are, are as it were Birkot Zman would it be appropriate to make a Shechayan if you were celebrating a wedding anniversary or even a birthday? Um, it's, it's a good question. I have not seen, it's I have not seen that anywhere. Um, and the, the act itself, like there, a commemoration of an act generally does not require a, a, a does not engender a sheikh, you know, there would be an act that is new this this year right, that you're doing for the first time, right, that's what would create the sheikh, I know, but simply commemorating something which happened in the past, even if it's an anniversary thereof, is something that generally does not bring with the sheikh, I know. I apologize, I do have something else I have to run to, so it's been wonderful learning with all of you, and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You okay. were wonderful. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Rav Gil. 1 p.m. in an hour, you can get a quick lunch. Rabbi Ari Shvat will talking about Orat HaTshuva, his series on Orat HaTshuva of Rav Kook, and then 8.30 tonight, Rabbi Shlomo Gemara, Parshat, Parshat Nitzavim, and I, as that's invited, and tomorrow morning, 9.30, the last of the series of Pirkei Avot for this, this, uh, this summer. And um, I see somebody put in a question. I know most people have left already. Vaccines, shaking, shaking, and vaccines. And I guess it's unfortunate we didn't get a chance to talk about it. I will say for whatever it's worth, I did make a shachiana when I got my vaccine, and there was some discussion to make a tova metiv shachiana, different brachot, any brachot. But uh, yes, I think so. That's a very interesting thing we'll have to leave for next time. Okay, everybody, uh, have a wonderful day. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Two more opportunities here in the Zoom Torn Motion Beit Midrash. And uh, have, uh, we look forward to learning with you. Thank you, everybody.